This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. Today is Wednesday, January 16th, and we are now officially 99 days from the 2024 <laughs> NFL Draft. Welcome into the Draft Show for the first time in 2024, presented okay. by Miller Lite. We okay. will be here twice a week from here on out. Unfortunately, a couple weeks early, but we're here nonetheless. You think you're so funny, don't you, Pat? 99 days. I looked that up this morning, and I had a mini heart attack myself. I will mention that it's January 17th and not 16th, but it's fine. D- what? <laughs> it's okay. Did I say 16th? It's okay. It's okay. It's I meant right. Wednesday, January. You're still back. living yesterday. That's okay. <laughs> Welcome into the draft show. <laughs> Nick's already cut off. We've got Zach Wolchuk, Nick Harris, the great Brian Broaddus, Aisha Morrison. I'm Kyle Yeomans, Chris Beam in the back. We will have Bobby Belt in the rotation as well throughout the draft show Ooh. here this season. And it is draft season, so... We will have all those guys. But, Brian, it's always uh, it's always bittersweet to be back in here because, one, we're, we're getting the talk draft season, but, two, it means the Cowboys season has come to a close. Yeah, that's usually the way things work. And, uh, you know, you felt like that maybe that you'd have a, a couple more opportunities to, to kind of uh, see this football team play. But uh, it it really is, you know, all year long – they have your season, and but the scouts are working on the draft, you know, and mm-hmm. we just pick it up. We, we, we cover the season, and then we try and catch up with the scouts and what's going on. But, you know, this is the way, uh, you know, this is the way you, you make your team better. Uh, you go out and you evaluate. We always talk about in the show, uh, we educate and investigate are the two things that we do here. And so, uh, you know, looking forward to doing that with all you. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's always a fun time of the year for me. Because I, I live this, this has been my life, and I'm so happy that I have teammates here that have a passion for it as well. And that's, I think, what makes this show so great is the the, the camaraderie, but the discussion about these players and, and how to make not only the Dallas Cowboys better, but we have fans from all over the, the country that watch this show and learn about players. So uh, we welcome you as well. Can't wait. And it's always a lot of fun. The more you dive into the draft process, and Aisha got her first taste of it last year. Zach got his first official taste of it. Nick, you're the rookie of the show this time around. So uh, it, the deeper you get into it, the the more fans enjoy the learning and yeah. the more learning that's had on our side as well. Investigate and educate all day, every day. And, and Nick, you've, you've been around a lot of these prospects from the recruiting trail. Yep. Excited to see how you kind of bring that extra taste into it on the draft side, too. Honestly, me too. Uh, Just kind of give everybody some perspective on where I come from. I uh, started working for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, This was uh, the first day was the first day of the draft for me last year. So uh, while I was getting everything situated, getting my HR paperwork in, I was watching you guys trying to handle who's going to get drafted in the first round. Uh, But yeah, this is my first time going through the draft process with you guys. Where I came from, I was covering college football recruiting for four to five years with 24-7 sports and rivals. Uh, My last two years was with rivals as a national analyst so whenever you see those high school kids get the stars put on them three four five star I was one of the seven guys that was doing that nationwide so whenever one of these two stars gets drafted in the first round I'm the one you can come to and be like you're stupid so uh, looking forward to it Ooh, I can't wait for that that's, that's gonna be cool. fun yeah. well, well, there, well there's gonna be say, a three star in the first round and we're gonna look at Nick and be like what were you doing I will say 2026 draft is when my evals will start coming uh, around so okay. yeah, I'll, I'll save the we beat for that we'll save the beat for that that's awesome Aisha you're number two how's it different for you this time around well if I'm being human and being very honest I'm not nearly as nervous as I was um it's it's this is not an easy feat coming up here and and Brian used to tell me like you can't fake it doing this and so the you know the work that you have to put in to be precise with it and people hold your feet to the fire you know and you guys will too so I think Coming into this season, I'm far more just comfortable being with you guys because I know you at this point. And as far as the process goes, I'm just learning to I can trust myself more, you know, because I have done it. And so now I'm like, I trust my eyes and uh, we can go for it. So I'm excited. 
That's I'm actually excited. That gets me pumped up. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The fact that you're going into year number two and you already feel that comfortable, like and you're you're back into your rhythm that mm-hmm. you already had last year. And I think everybody can speak to you did a phenomenal job in year number one. Year number two is going to be even better. I can't wait. I will say this. The anxiety never goes away. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> it never really <laughs> does. True. But, I mean, because, like you say, you're, you feel responsible. You really do. Oh, and, and especially when you're sitting in that chair across the hall up there when you're <laughs> drafting players, you feel responsible for what's going out there. And so, yeah, that's that's the great thing about it. And you, you, your, uh, your misses uh, resonate with you more than your makes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's nice when people remind you about the makes, though. Because that's that makes you feel a little bit better about the job you're doing. It happens every once in a while. Yeah. You'll get one yeah. where it's like, hey, you got this guy right. Yep. We appreciate all the insight. But more often than not, it's, what? why did you guys have this guy so yeah. high? Or why did you have yeah. him so low? Yeah. And it always turns sure. into that. Zach, you had that a couple times last year. Oh, yeah. Yoshi Bosch ended up making me look pretty good. The Princeton <laughs> kid from yeah. the Bengals. I got a couple. But then, uh, yeah, there, there were some, you know, Emmanuel Forbes, I think we were all high on. Love and this. I definitely got the, uh, well, gosh, you guys loved Emmanuel Forbes. Yeah. Look at him. He's getting benched over there in Washington. Washington, what do you know? But <laughs> hey, it's part of the process, and I don't think that you can go ahead and just write a kid off after a rookie season. No. I know we'll talk about that with some of the Cowboys from this past draft as well. Yeah, there's a lot to dive into. I do want to get into the recent reaction, though, with the way that the season ended. You, you give up 40 to 48 points. Almost said 42. I'm giving six points to this Dallas defense. 48 points Ooh. in the wild card round to Green Bay. You fall 48 to 32. You, you get bounced in a, in a round that you anticipated to win, and things really do change on a dime. I mean, one week we're talking about Mike McCarthy and extensions and, and everything that can happen there. Dan Quinn's a, a shoe in for head coaching jobs around the league, and then all of a sudden you put a halt on him really every conversation, and you don't know what the future of this franchise really looks like. Brian, when it comes to the draft and, and, and really the team's perspective, how much can things change just over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, it, it can change quite a bit. You know, and now everybody goes, for, they'll have their meetings, they've dim- dismissed the team, you know, the coaching staff, you'll get everything kind of squared up. We'll see what happens with DQ and his interviews. You know, you have to maybe prepare for him being gone. Do you have to get a, deep, a different defensive coordinator? Does that change the philosophy? Is there a coordinator coming from the outside if that's the case? Uh, is he a 4 3 3 4? You know, does he mesh with what we're trying to do? Dan was really involved with personal. Personnel. And so if Dan were to move on, now, now you're trying to think, okay, well, all those players that we really watched all year that Dan really liked, mm-hmm. now where someone else might come in here and say, well, this is the type of player I want. you know, And that's, that's the tough thing on scouts. They have to go back now and bring back potential players that they might not have liked or graded well enough for the team but you have a new defensive coordinator. So any type of tweak with the coaching staff could be a little bit of a a stress on your scouting staff. How much does that put a pressure on a potential hire coming in? Because there's there's already an infrastructure laid from the draft picks you've made, from the roster that's been put on the field recently. But, Nick, whenever you look at maybe even potential candidates, whether it's at head coach or defensive coordinator, how much does that put a pressure on them to come in and immediately either change or keep things the same? Yeah, I think there's going to have to be a pressure to change, right? Because if, they, if they're brought in, they're brought in to change. I mean, that's that's what kind of the whole conversations are this week about, you know, how much change do you want to instill on the, the cornerstones of this roster, the cornerstones of this team? Uh, and I think if someone's brought in to do that, then they're going to have to do that, especially considering when you look at it from a draft perspective, what the 2023 draft class put on the table this last season, being able to have a successful 24 class I think there's even more pressure on that, whether that be for a first guy or the guys that are already here. Uh, I, I think that would be equal pressure in that sense. Yeah. Man, it, it really does change things pretty quickly. But how did it change your perspective on the way that this roster has been built, the way that they were bounced out of that wild card round and, and really dismantled by Green Bay? I mean, yeah, I, I think that – and it really I don't want to upset anybody, but listen, this league is ever-changing, evolving – I feel like uh, I personally felt like the big nickel in the way that it's been used and just kind of some of the things they do on the defensive side of the ball has been really good for this system. But I do think just like every other thing in football, at some point in time, people figure some stuff out. Yeah. And they figure out how to counter it. And I think this is year three, four, whichever year it is. I think some defenses, I mean, because it would be different if it was just like one or two times. 
But every time that you got beat, it was people attacking Mm -hmm. that part of your defense. And so to me, I do think there's some changes that have to be made or some uh, it's okay to take a step back and also to reevaluate and see if, if you need to change some things or how you can adjust. So for me, it's like if there's a new coordinator coming in, I thought Brian made a really good point about even looking at some of the players now, I'm like, I don't know the foundation of what this defense might look like yeah. next year yeah. as opposed to we went into last year looking at Forbes like, this is a ball hawk guy, yeah. press, yeah. all that lengthy corner. Mm-hmm. That's the prototype. For what, you know, this defensive staff likes or that side of the ball. But now you're like, well, man, like if there's a philosophy change, what what is the foundation? And so I do think it also puts some not pressure on us, but it does change how we even attack this show, I right. think, at this point. So now yeah, for me, I'm just like, if there's changes that need to be necessary, I need them to go ahead and, you know, decide to do that. But <laughs> I'm just being I'm just being honest, yeah. man, like because the way that you lost in these games was because of not that side of the ball to me. Yeah, a lot I, of it. Yeah. I think there's a really good point to make on the defensive side that you made because yeah. you already made the changes on the offensive side. You, you figured those out last offseason, and I feel like the offense had a pretty strong year from from by any measures, especially if you look at week six going into the bye week and what they did coming out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there was a lot of positive that you could take away from that. But you look at the defensive side and how, like you said, wherever they lose, it was the same exact areas of the defense that were getting attacked. You can't go into Oxnard next year with the same exact thing that you finished with on Sunday afternoon. Absolutely You're going to have to make some sort of major change and I think that starts with the defensive side of the ball because they haven't done that yet they already did the offensive side all right let's do a defensive overhaul let's see what that looks like can I ask you guys a a philosophy question coming out of Oxnard did we all think that they went short at linebacker yes absolutely everyone was concerned about see to me that's where I felt like the house of cards was right now and 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 I think Dan was trying his best to put what I would say a band aid on an amputation. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, if you really like that. Bell. Well, be fair. And, 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 you know, yeah. and Bell, and, and you talked about Bell and, 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 and what he could do and all that. You brought up, I think you gave a great thumbnail about the player and all. But see, this is where I, you know, you wonder about philosophy. They made a determination to go short at linebacker, and they trusted that Van Der Esch would stay healthy. You know, the overshone injury was just it was tragic from what we saw during training camp. There were some things philosophy-wise that they chose to do that the end of the year really just showed its ugly head. And, you know, and I think that's what they have to go back and study. Like when we were coming out of camp, what did we think? Why did we think this? Yeah. And I think that put a lot of stress on the defense for some of the things that the, some of the decisions that they made. Yeah. I think we were pretty excited about Overshown, right? So I mean, yeah. I think that's yeah. a great point. Like for Dan Quinn, you look at the undersized nature of this defense, and you're absolutely right, Aisha. Teams were exploiting that, but yeah. I, you, you were hoping to have LV, right? You were hoping to have Overshown, but I think fair. that this. This team is very well built to win the Mm -hmm. NFC East. I think now you need to look at, okay, how can you match up with the San Francisco? How can you match up in the postseason when you get there? Because I think we believe this team's good. This team's going to win double-digit games every single year. But once we get into the playoffs, there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect there. You need to get bigger. You need to get bigger, and you need to get stronger for me. And that's kind of a difference that I'm looking at instead of just simply speed. Well, we all evaluated Mozzie Smith. Yep. Right? Yeah. And Amazi Smith was supposed to be the 330 pound defensive tackle. And next mm-hmm. thing I know, I'm watching tape and I, I call Aisha. I go, Does Amazi Smith look small to you? You know, and we all were kind of, Yeah, he looks small on He's tape. He's playing at like 307. Yeah. yeah. See, that's yeah. what I'm saying. All of a sudden, there's some philosophy things on defense. And yeah, they absolutely do need to get bigger, tougher, I think is something. But we talked about toughness two years ago against San Francisco, right? You know, some things have to change, yeah. uh, you know, what, what, what exactly what you're saying. Yeah. It's a, I said on our show yesterday, I said, one of the, one of the changes I'm looking to see, Hey man, listen, if you, if you keep the head coach in the OC, fine. For the love of God, bring an advisor or somebody in here that understands the Shanahan tree. Yeah. Because defensively and offensively, they give you trouble and mm-hmm. it's not getting any better. Yeah. The Rams have turned it around and figured their life out. 
Green Bay looks like an up-and-coming team. Yeah. You got to see these people. You're going to have to see, and the 49ers could possibly be just as good next year. You're going to yeah. have to keep seeing these these guys. And then also, too, on the AFC side, to your point, you played a lot of unfamiliar opponents this year, and it showed. And so I thought that was I thought that was a good point that you guys made in regard to like okay well this team is beat to you that it's built to build the NFC to beat the NFC NFC East oh yeah cool yeah but you need to look at how do you match up against everyone else as well can this travel can this philosophy be extended across the NFL because baby if you once you get in the playoffs or when, if you're trying to get to the bowl you're gonna see an AFC yeah. team yeah. there's no avoiding yeah. them at no this doubt. point so it's like to your point broadening the the matchups and the personnel I think is going to be important but also finding identity identity and philosophy on both sides of the both sides of the ball that's conducive to be successful in the league is going to be important moving forward agreed and they got to figure out on offense how do you run the football yep and it's a little bizarre you look up and you've got two first team all pros at guard that you is got a the, second team all pro at tackle yeah that you could not run the ball yeah. all year do you All think they look at that? Do you think they I, look at the coordinator position? Even though a lot of the players love Solari, is that something that maybe you look at? The inability to you run the ball? You may have to, you, but it, uh, if anything, I think it's a philosophy from your head coach, and f- your play caller. Not just the head coach specifically. but He sold us on the idea caller. that we're going to run yeah. the ball, right? <laughs> All <laughs> training camp long, run the ball, run the ball, run yeah. the ball, and yeah. then you, you – can't run the ball. That, yeah. that that's troubling to me. Yeah. If if you're saying there's an emphasis on running the football, and you've got three All Pros up front, two first team, one second team, what are we doing? you should be the best running team in the country, and or at least top five. And you barely cracked to top fifteen, and yeah. you're just mad in terms of running the football. Bringing up a lot of these points: linebacker, defensive tackle, offensive line, different elements of this team. Is there one specific? position of need i asked the question yesterday on twitter and it was resounding linebacker as the number one (laughs) but i I think we could all kind of look around the table and say linebackers maybe not what 24 overall is going to constitute no no, no. that's not a spot for 24 overall unless it's the perfect player and it's somebody that you feel like is going to be a starter for 12 years in the league and yada 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 but where is the the position of need right now for this dallas cowboys team uh, for me, I'm looking offensive line. I, I want a guy that has versatility up front. I want a guy who can play multiple positions. I want a guy that can come into the building and be able to, okay, we could fit you in there if you work there. If Tyler Plug Smith moves to tackle, yeah. maybe we can keep Tyler Smith at guard, move you to tackle. You look at a guy like Graham Barton out of Duke. I mean, yeah. he's, he's a guy oh, yes. that's in the first, player first player name of the year, let's baby. Go. Let's go. Graham Barton. <laughs> okay. That is your Graham pick. Barton out of Duke. Graham Barton's uh, your pick at 24. I mean, he's, he's, he's a guy that could play all five. I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost <laughs> confident he could play all five up front. Yeah. Um, and then you look in the second round, a guy like Jackson Powers Johnson. He's a guy that's played four of the five up front for Oregon in the last two seasons. So, you know, I, I want to bring in a guy that has a ton of versatility. Uh, and they've shown to do that. Awesome Richards, they were hoping to have that little versatility with him. Most of the guys that they drafted in the 23 draft class played multiple positions in college, and they wanted to fit them around, figure out what to do with them. I think they continue that philosophy, but they try to find a little bit better talent in that area. Yeah, the, the deepest position groups are offensive tackle and wide receiver in the first round this yeah. year. Uh, I think with Without question. Now, linebacker, a lot of people, you're right, they're going to want, want a backer. I think maybe Edron Cooper from Texas A&M could be your top guy. I love Cedric Gray from North Carolina. I mm-hmm. watched him last night. That dude flies around, makes a lot of plays. But I think day two, maybe early day three, that's when you can attack linebacker, just from what I've seen so far. But the meat in the first round's offensive line. There's a couple of tackles that are super athletic, but I, I do think you need to probably improve at center. I think when this team yeah. had issues and, uh, you know, it's nothing against Tyler Biotish, but it was, it was in the middle, right? And I think that a lot of your run issues were because of that, and I think when Dak had issues, it was because immediately, and every quarterback's going to have this, it's pressure in your face. You've got to have a guy, and I think Rand Barton's perfect for this. I think he kicks inside at the next level. I think he's a guard or a center. I don't think he's big enough to play tackle. I think the same thing about Fontenot from Washington. I think he's 6'2", was an outstanding tackle at college, but to me, he's got that squatty guard body. Those are two kind of guys, to me, I'm looking at if they fall to 24. Rand Barton, I think, is the nastiest offensive lineman that I looked at. He's a finisher. He wants to put your ass on the ground, right? And I think you need a little bit of that physicality and toughness. What? Let Brian go. 
No, he just said drop that ass on the ground. I just you wanted said to look that? at you. He said yeah. put your ass on the ground, but he drops that ass. I no. just wanted to look at Aisha and if we could, wanted to throw back. One to of the best scouting terms I've ever heard. Drop that ass. <laughs> drop that ass. You're telling me the guy from Duke he drops his ass. The guy on Duke. Listen. He can drop this that is ass. not a family friendly show <laughs> anymore. <laughs> we have, we've we've what taken a jump Rido? up to PG thirteen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, um, Listen, I, I don't want to be the cliche and, and mention linebacker, but y'all already took in, y'all have already taken offensive line. Man, listen. No, go um, ahead and take a linebacker. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll dance with you here. Yeah, I mean, we you talk about you know late later down in the in the rounds, you know maybe not taking one day one, maybe not even day two, depending on. I like uh, Maurice Lafau from Notre Dame, mm, uh, outside okay. linebacker. All right. Um, I took a lot. I took a look at him. I like his lateral quickness. Um, he has the ability to rush the passer, but his y'all. He plays that line of aggressiveness like very, very well. He stays, he's even tempered, but he can be a little hot headed and he's Love his that. motor is crazy. He's listen, uh yeah, he's someone. Um he has the hair and everything. <laughs> uh but and he was a Buckus Award finalist as go. well. So he's he's people know that this guy can play. Um they didn't they didn't uh they were top ten in defense yeah, and this crazy sure guy was a part of it sure because was. he plays with his hair on fire. But I just like how he comes downhill and tackles. He's physical, um and he also has coverage instincts. I was which, gonna ask you, yeah. can he cover? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean honestly yeah. when you look at this linebacker class a lot of them can, they can cover. cover. Yeah, they can run. And it's, it's kind of cool because we like talked that. about it last year, just kind of the evolution of the position. But he's a good balance of I can cover, but I can come downhill and I'm going to make you pay. And I do think that that's something you want to look for. But I look at the lateral quickness, too, when you're talking about how do you beat some of these guys that do a lot of motion and all that stuff or attack your linebackers, he has some of that in him. So I was looking at him last night, and I was very impressed by what I saw. So maybe if you want to get a – guy maybe like the third round or fourth round if that's what you decide to do this guy can ball yeah and one thing to add about maris lua foul he, he comes from Hunt, I, I believe lua foul yeah he we comes haven't from, had the uh, official pronunciation <laughs> yet. I yeah, we're, getting, we're getting on that uh but he comes from punahou uh hawaii which is in north honolulu and those guys are known for being run stoppers i mean notre dame loves to go get those samoan mm-hmm. guys to, to fill into that second level there's another one we'll talk about next year in nuafe to halamaka but talking about lua foul for this Thank year God we got him for the names he, he, he started <laughs> he started as a that's DB. my bit nick back off <laughs> he started as a db that. in high school yeah. and and being able to add that weight get up to 240 and add that run stopping ability that he trains with down in Honolulu because they can't throw the ball down there I mean I'm sorry Tua was the only one yeah. that really to really come out of there that could so yeah. having to go through those four years run stopping and being able to fill that and then also having that DB background it really helped him once he got to Notre Dame he's a guy I really like as well that has a little bit of versatility a little raw He's still, t- to me, to me, I think he still has some stuff that he has to work on, but I like that because I think he has all the tools, and you can just put him out there and Hit let him gym. grow. That sounds, into that. Yeah, that got, sounds great. He got some hit stick to him, the, too. The one position group that I think is drastically different from last year that is pretty thin is running back, and that's another spot Taters where I think the Cowboys are going to be looking at. That was a group that last year we were talking about 10 deep at running back. We're like, man, you can get a guy on day two. You're feeling really good about it. This year, the best guy that I've watched so far, Trey Benson from Florida State. Yeah. I think he can do everything you want. But, okay. I mean, a Jonathan Brooks out of Texas I think is a really good player, but he's coming off of the injury. Yeah. Right. A lot of these guys decided to go back. I was high on Donovan Edwards from Michigan, he's mm-hmm. going back to school. Tra- Travion Henderson from Ohio State going back to school. You know, Blake Corum now has put himself in the conversation of being a lot of carries on that body. The, but, and he's 5'8". Yeah. Do you want to go with another smaller back there? Yeah. So, I mean, running back and linebacker are the two spots that I think are big needs for this team, but I don't think that there's really going to be a guy, when you look at draft value, that you can take super high. And even like Jonathan Brooks at the top of that, yeah. I mean, he's he's up there on the list, but he's coming off of an injury exactly. as well. So the, it feels like this entire running back class has questions. And this is a team that was in the market for a running back last year. They took Deuce Vaughn in the sixth round. But even before that, we were sitting in this podcast studio and looking at guys like Zach Charbonnet, mm-hmm. Devin Achan, mm-hmm. uh, Tank Bigsby. It felt like every round they were looking at a guy and yeah. then they would – he would get slipped out from underneath them. Yeah, that's, and then they didn't end up getting anybody. There's value. There's value, in the, and that that you guys are right though. That position was so deep. It was a fun group to study. I'm going to throw a guy out at you real quick here, if I could. I know are we up against on a break here. We can uh, we can get one guy in. How about this? I, I drafted this guy's dad at Philadelphia, <laughs> and uh, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. If you're talking about <laughs> linebackers, <laughs> you liking this? Yeah, one? I watched him I, last I knew you'd night. Bring him up. This guy's my Nick Bolton from the Kansas City Chiefs. Ooh. 
We love Nick Bolton in 2020. That's how you feel today, Brian. That's how I feel today. Frisco Lone Star. I'm, and it's only going to get better, kid. <laughs> but, yeah, this kid, like I said, I drafted his dad in 98 and while I was with the Eagles. And he plays with fire and passion. He's super competitive. The way he moves. Now, people say watch the Duke game. He had some problems in that game. He absolutely wasn't one of his best games. Watch Notre Dame. Watch North Carolina. Watch some of these other games. And you'll kind of figure some things out. But this guy plays downhill. He plays fast. He knows how to cover. He's got the lateral agility, the quickness, the sideline to sideline. I saw him at the time. The ball carriers are at the sticks. He's hitting the guy and is stopping right there. This guy's a powerful player. His dad was a powerful player. He's got instinct, too. This mm -hmm. guy's a wrap-up tackler. He can finish and all that. He's six foot, though. I don't know where teams are going to look at him, but when you watch him play, Again, it reminded me of Nick Bolton when he was at Missouri, that he was shorter, but he was making every single play. And so Jeremiah Trotter Jr., uh, my guy, uh, and I'll say it right now because I, I think he's a hell of a football player. So you drafted his dad. Yeah. Who was? I know the draft grades are not complete as a whole, but yeah. who's a better prospect, more well-rounded well Took prospect. his dad in the third round. His son's a better – his son's would probably go a lot higher. Second round. Yeah, yeah, second yeah, round. yeah okay. exactly. He's, he's fun. pretty good. No, he's, fun to watch. Did I see yeah. him right? Did I get oh, him? heck yeah, oh, you man. Did. I, watched him, I watched him last night, and um, I literally rolled down. I said, if you're going to chip him, you better bury him. Yeah. Because mm. he's not – he's hair on fire. Can I steal that from you? Yeah, you can definitely <laughs> steal it. Like, you, you better nasty. bury him. I like that. Yeah. And I was looking at, to your point, uh, I said his turbos are crazy. Turbos yeah. being the closing speed. Yeah. yeah. He has – you know how you watch Micah and you see him close on yeah. people? Yeah. That's, Downhill acceleration that, burst. And it, it's it's crazy. He just jumps on people so quickly. Um, I, I did write down some people may worry about his size. Yeah, they're going to worry about his height. Have we not learned our lesson from Ivan Pace at yeah. all? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm Ivan just, Pace went yeah. undrafted. Yeah. Yeah. Respectfully. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Have we not learned uh -huh. our lesson there? If we're so, talking about successes as a show, that was one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was with <laughs> y'all the whole that way. That was one. I was with y'all the whole you way. Were, I will back you up Nick. It. He was talking about it. Yeah. He was texting me last, yeah. last year. I don't know right. how that yeah. got upstairs. Didn't get yeah. Yeah. And uh, also, too, with Trotter, what stood out to me was are the ball skills yeah. when the ball's in the air. Yeah. He's snatching that thing. Yeah. He's good at under. I mean, he plays with his eyes really he's well. He's snatching that thing you know, like a DB. Thing. His dad had nine, nine interceptions in his career. His right. dad was a badass. He really was. Four time Pro Bowl. So yeah. if yeah. he's a better a prospect, I'll take that. I'll take a four time Pro Bowler. Yeah. Yeah, he finished this he finished his career thirteen sacks, thirteen PBUs as a as a linebacker. Yeah. yeah. All right, boss. Move wait, around. Wait till we start talking about Frank Gore versus Frank Gore Jr. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. A little Southern Miss action. All right, when we come back here on the draft show, we'll continue on with some tell Glad me I got more. That guy right. <laughs> We've got some pet cat abilities early on, some some guys that we just feel like we're gravitating toward. We're gonna talk about it when we come back with more of the draft show right after this. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott, who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. I'm Darren Woodson, former Dallas Cowboy player and Super Bowl champion. When I played in the NFL at a high level, I relied on my vision to see the field. As I started getting older, I noticed my vision wasn't as good, and I was getting frustrated from wearing my glasses all day. I went to the Laser Care Eye Center, and Dr. G talked about all the options. Thanks to technology and Laser Care Eye Center, I can see near, far, and between. Don't fumble your vision any longer. Visit them at dfweyes.com and tell them Darren sent you. They got me back on my game. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus. 
at Lincoln.com. Hi, I'm Danny McRae, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl, handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or any time you want to munch. And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Back here on the Draft Show, we are 99 days away from the 2024 <laughs> NFL Draft. Alongside Nick Harris, Brian Broaddus, Aisha Morrison, Zach Wolchuk, I'm Kyle Yeomans. Man, it, it is crazy. 99 days. It feels like we have zero time. And it's even closer. The uh, Senior Bowl's coming up in a yes, couple sir. of weeks. Yeah. Did you get your credentials already? Yep. I'm ready to fly out here in about 12 days. So that'll be fun. Let's that'll go. be fun. Nick Harris yep. will be on the way to the uh, the Senior Bowl. I'll be at the Shrine Game down the down the hallway <laughs> here at the Star. First year that the Shrine Game is going to be in town. So yeah. it's going to be really cool. But Dave Burglar's going to be in town, he told me. so He's coming to the Shrine Game? He's coming to, he's coming to check it out. We might, him if, a we, if we have a show, we might have to That's pop awesome. him in oh, here we'll somehow. Pop him in here. Yeah. We'll make sure he's in here. Uh, I mean, as much as these all-star games are going to show, they're going to start popping up pet cats left and right. They're going to yeah. start popping up these these players of interest, guys that you just love in practice. You love their tenacity. You love their, their fight. And then it's also going to take a knock on some guys at the same time. So before we even get into all-star games, I want to know some of the guys that you guys are looking at, and we'll start with Zach Wolchuk. Who's your early pet cat? Ooh, okay. Any position, it could be a position of need, could be yeah. just an overall BPA. What you got? So I mentioned uh, Cedric Gray, linebacker from North Carolina earlier, uh, but probably my favorite player I've watched so far is Javon Bullard, the defensive back from Georgia. Mm. Like this dude's a, a, just a dog. He saw action as a freshman. He was named defensive MVP of the national title game uh, against TCU and the semifinal against Ohio State. So big game player. He will thump you. Super physical downhill player. And you know he's not a guy that's going to throw his body in there. We've seen that a lot. He will wrap up and he will run absolutely through you. He's got a reckless abandon about him. He's really good against the run. Can come down, cover the slot as well. Like that's what's interesting about this guy is his safety. I think he can match up and line up inside against the slot as well. Love his aggression and play temperament. He's a competitor. Gets everyone lined up. Like you can see the football intelligence and the leadership back there. Everybody on that Georgia secondary. And if you're taking a Georgia player that plays in the secondary, you're probably getting a dog. To me, he's the best one that is back there. Everyone's looking to him. Am I in the right place? Am I lined up? Short area quickness. He's got recovery speed, high motor guy, can chase down plays from the backside. I'm a big Javon Bullard fan. I think he might be the best DB that I've watched, period. So, period. Like this oh, year? Right. Any out of, year? Out of all the corner, just this year. Just oh, this just year. this year. I was about to say. I was like, oh my goodness. But I've watched a lot of the top corners in this draft so yeah. far, and there's some good ones. Like Arnold from Alabama, yeah. I think he's the best corner in the draft. But Bullard, just as a pure defensive back prospect, to me, he's my most fun tape study so far. It may not bother many because he does play safety and he has some safety nickel flex but he's five foot eleven and he's listed at a buck ninety five so it may even be smaller whenever the combine comes around does that bother you at all he just plays bigger and like for his frame to me he doesn't look skinny like it's not when you're looking and last year we saw an Emmanuel Forbes and you're like dang that guy's wiry yeah. to yeah. me he's filled out pretty well and he could probably put on some weight I'm sure the teams might want him to do so but the way that he moves and the way he's just so physical and tough to me the size is not an issue for him at all Love that. There's another one of those light corners, uh, weight wise. Has anybody seen Abrams J uh, Drain from Missouri? Yeah, that's that's funny because I was uh, I was about is to that mention. Your guy? Is he your guy? Is that your I was guy? I was going to mention the other Missouri corner. Okay, okay. Uh, oh. but you go ahead. No, go no, ahead. go ahead. No, I, that, I, <clears throat> I'm going to take a uh, Ennis Rakestraw uh, from uh, okay. from Missouri. So he's a, okay. yeah, he's a Duncanville guy. There we go. Uh, he's just yeah, so yeah. biased. Yeah. So the, I, I wanted to throw out a precursor here. Not every pet cat I'm going to have is going to be a guy I used to cover. <laughs> but this from is a guy I used to cover. He's a South Oak Cliff, like <laughs> stand up. But uh, there's two legitimate corners here from Missouri that are going to be day yeah. one, day two type guys. I look at Ennis Rakestraw. I want to start from the top with him. He was a guy uh, back in the, the 2019 uh, or going into the 2020 uh, uh, recruiting class. He had zero offers going into the final two weeks of the recruiting cycle. Nothing. He he was looking at uh, FCS options. Uh, Alcorn State was one that was popping out for him. He had a huge state championship against North Shore, Alabama, Missouri, Texas. They all offered immediately, and those were 
the three hats on the table for him on signing day, and he chose Missouri, and he could have gone to Alabama. He could have gone to Texas. Missouri showed him a lot of love, and it was a huge win for Eli Drinkwitz. There's actually a video out there of Drinkwitz throwing a drink in the air and losing <laughs> his mind over getting Rake Straw on signing day. But he started year one for them, uh, all 10 games uh, in, in that 2020 season, and he has started every game since that he's been healthy at least. This past year, he didn't get thrown on him. I, it's he, he does not get tested at all, and it allowed for opportunities for Chris Abrams' drain, and Chris yeah. Abrams' drain got a lot of work as he a result, did. and it was it's actually huge for him, because I think going into the season for Chris Abrams' strain, you were looking at a guy who was, you know, potentially a day three type guy, yeah. you know, but just needed reps, and boy, did he get him, because Ennis Rakestraw was on the other side locking things down. He's six foot, 188. He's going to be really lanky, but he's got really long arms. He's going to press a guy right off the line and get physical. He has that Duncanville uh, physicality, tenacity that you, you love to see from a corner. He's got the aura. Yeah, he's, he he's definitely got it. Um, he's a guy that's starting to sneak in, into that late first round type of t- type of territory. Yeah. I think for me, I would take him mid-second, but I think he's a guy that's awesome. I, 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 I really do enjoy him. Those Missouri corners are fun. They're, they're a good group to watch. You gonna help me with this name from UCLA, the, the edge rusher? Uh, oh, oh, that's my guy's first name. Yeah. Give me a second. I want to see if I can find it. Laiatsu. <laughs> Laiatsu. I believe it's Laiatsu. But again, Laiatu, we're gonna. Laiatu. I'm about to go through all of these. Is it La? La- Latu is Latu 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 yeah Latu for sure I, I feel embarrassed because like I said I'm trying to learn these names but I, I'll tell you what you watch this tape he's an edge from a UCLA yeah he transferred from Washington he's a no nonsense player he's relentless effort pursuit nonstop most of his work is done from the two point stance this guy's six five two sixty five mm-hmm. you know so you're kind of thinking oh well maybe he's got a, a three four defensive end kind of a build, you know, that 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 just that that you know, five technique head up guy. No, this guy could play on the edge. And when you start to talk about him, it's the speed, it's the quickness, it's the length. He gives blockers trouble. He breaks guys down. He's a SWAT swim. Hands are always going nonstop technique. Um, he's got diverse pass rush moves too. And I, I really do like this kid. I know Dallas might not be looking at an edge but if you want to talk about a guy, if you're if you're one of these fans that maybe another team that's looking at edge, look at Latu from uh, from UCLA. Where's number fifteen? Hmm. Now the thing about him is he's dealt with some injury history. He's he's had a medical history, and he had to like step away from the game and then got cleared back to being able to play. So we'll see how that affects him. But man, this guy as a run defender, pass rusher, the way he plays is just really really outstanding and I think the Indy Combine will tell the story of this guy if he slides down the draft he might be one of these guys on the board at 24 that might give or take mm. you, have to it, take it. you might be you're going to look at it and say maybe it's just too much that you yes. can't pass a guy like this because uh, but you know we, we some of the comparisons are what Lucas Van Ness the kid we saw from Iowa, Iowa last yeah. year, that kind of some of that comparison, yeah. maybe a little bit better player there. I, I think he I is. Would I would definitely say I think a, he's a little, a little bit twitchy, more, a little more yeah. bend. Yeah, yes. definitely. Like Lotu to me, I think is the best pass rusher in the draft in terms of edges. Yeah. Him and Verse, Jeez, I'm two for two. To me, I, I think you're nailing <laughs> it. The, the guy that I'm going to throw lost out there yet. that I could be totally wrong on, and I know I've talked to Brian about this, and he's getting love like he's the best edge rusher in the draft is Dallas Turner. Okay. I don't think I'm Man. a Dallas Turner guy. Yeah, Dallas like, to me, I'm taking Latu over Dallas Turner. I'm to me, you. Dallas I'm Turner looks the part. <clears throat> I, I, he physically is very, very impressive, but I think he runs himself out of play sometimes. He's got a good stab and a rip inside. He drops off into coverage, which is also a little bit weird. I don't know why you're doing that sometimes with him. <laughs> but to me, I just didn't see as hyped as he is as a top 10 type of player. I didn't see that when I watched him play. He's a freak athlete, and I think scouts will look at that and be like, "Gosh, I can make him an absolute Pro Bowl, All Pro player." But give me lot to if I had to if I had to pick between the two of them. I think the guy, if he filled a twenty four, goodness, I mean, how the, the, medi- uh, the, the medicals goodness. are going to be the medicals are going to be. <laughs> That's what's I mean, going to so much yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. The, no. Well, if you're comparing him to Lucas Van Ness, I mean, Van Ness was taken by the Packers at thirteen. Yeah. So I mean, and well, he was he was not the, the top edge, and rusher. we was. Yeah. I remember our reactions. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah, because we didn't love like Van But Ness. that's what people comparison. I think I think I think he's I more, think the UCLA kid's a better player yeah, than Van Ness. Yeah, last year when we were it was so many edges, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. There it was a lot, lot of edges, edges. edges and I can't remember what his name was, but there was one that everyone was so high on early and we was like Tyree Wilson? Tyree Texas Wilson. Tech? Yeah. That's oh, it. Yeah. Yeah. We were like 
Mean? We all kind of talked about it. Like, good player, yeah. top 10 pick, maybe not. I mean, that was kind of the I thought That's process. what I felt Dallas like about Turner's Dallas Turner. Call. He's yeah. the... That's what that's like exactly Wilson? what went yes. to mind. That came yeah, yeah, Cowboys fans, if y'all are worried athletes. about Mozzie Smith and his rookie year, go go talk to a Raiders fan about Tyree Wilson. Yeah. That <laughs> was oh bad. my goodness. Well, that was Lots bad. who kind of gives me he has a little bit of Joey Bosa in him. He's got that crazy size, 6'5", 265 coming yeah. off the edge. Um he's but he's athletic and yeah. he used that in athleticism and he's got a lot of power, may need to uh, improve a little bit on technique because it, it's yeah. clear that he's used power his whole life. Um, but he's athletic as hell. I, I that's a guy you would love to have. It's funny you brought up Latu <laughs> as a trans her from Washington. Yeah. My guy is currently finishing his Washington tenure. Braylon Trice, oh. edge rusher, wears the single digit. Like that too. Technician. He's strong, six foot four, yeah. 275. <clears throat> gets off the line of scrimmage. He's working guys backwards. He, he does have a, a run stuffing ability. He can move laterally. He knows how to close things out. The one thing is he doesn't have a great change of direction. He's not very bendy. Mm-hmm. That's not his game, he's though. Not. His game is a power game. A little top heavy. Yeah, he's very t- yeah. he's strong up front, but yeah. that's that's where I've got him. I haven't watched a ton of edge rushers, only three at the moment, but he was my first watch, and I really did like him. I'm with him. you on that. There's something okay. about him that stands out that you're like, okay. right? And I put out a, a tweet that is probably going to get caught on old takes exposed <laughs> oh, three, love three that. years from now, but I was great. like, give me Braylon Trice over Dallas Turner. Well, Wow. Yeah. Who do you got? There? I don't. I, first of all, no, no, no. Comment. I haven't watched Dallas Turner yet, but I, I, just hearing the the hype with him, I feel scary. like that would be a tough. As a tough top thing. ten guy, I'm, I'm thinking of Braylon Trice at like 24, like yeah, that, like too. back half of the first. Just I'm not going to be a better pro. I think Braylon Trice. Think might Braylon be. Trice might be that guy. I like it. Brian took my pick at. Oh, who is it? It was Latu? No, it was Jeremiah Trotter. Oh. I was, no, talk about him, please. I, was, I, I talked about him enough. Uh, no, no, I, about uh, him. I wanted to. This is another guy that caught my attention. Y'all don't don't roast me. But Already. I know we're talking about running back. Okay. And maybe that it's not nearly as good as it was last year. Yeah. But uh, Marshawn Lloyd out of USC stood out to me mm-hmm. uh, a little bit. Uh, transferred from uh, South Carolina to U- USC. Um, USC to USC. USC. Yeah. Y'all make me so <laughs> sick. Oh, it's going to be a long year. I can't year. believe that just happened. <laughs> USC to USC. They're both going to show up in an LSU jersey next yeah. week. It's just going to be great. Please. But no, nah, he, he stood out to me. Um, he just... The, the the shiftiness and his cutback ability it it stands out to you. Um, I was looking at the just the overall foot quickness was there and but the specifically the short area quickness is off the charts to me. Um, and I feel like he also too if he sees it he can go. I, I like the acceleration. The top speed is not elite or it's not like super high but again I think you you can deal with it with the short area quickness uh the lateral agility is crazy he's strong too like his lower half is crazy now he's 5'9 so I don't know if anybody w- would care about that he's 210 I care a little bit he's 210 5'9 so, but Pretty stout. But I can, I can I can rock with 5'9 he's very, st- he's very he's very stout his yeah. lower half of his like body is really ball. strong yeah. to that point he is not afraid to pick up a blitz he is not afraid to get his nose in there with pass pro. That's so, that's a huge point. So some, you know, because when people look at smaller running backs, they yeah. like, you know, are people going to be trampling him? No, like he's his lower half allows him to be able to stand in there and, and hit, uh, do some of these blitz pickups and things like that. I think he would thrive in a zone scheme um, because again, like some of his lateral quickness is off the charts. Uh, so he got my attention. There's not a whole, like I said, we talked about. There's it. not a lot of the running back class is not what it was last year, right. but. This guy, I think, can play the game. My question for you on Marshawn Lloyd, and um, I know we're early in the process here, so it might be tough to make a comparison, but you look at a guy like Blake Corum, who has similar size, a little bit better production, a little bit more speed. How do you kind of differentiate the two? Um, For me, now, when you look at Blake, because I I watched him for quite a bit of time, obviously there's a lot of of tape on him. There's a lot of of touchdown tape, He's been doing a lot. Um, I think that Marshawn is a little bit more punishing as far as power. And I like Blake, um, and I like what he's able to do. But at the same time, I do I, I think Marshawn has a good balance of the power and the speed and the lateral quickness. I know I know Quorum can do a lot of stuff and um, bounce to the outside, and he displays patience and things like that. I think Marshawn has these things, but if he dips his shoulder, he's going to make you pay. You're going to feel him a little bit more to me than what you're going to feel Quorum. So that would, to me, be the distinction between the two. Um, they both don't have, like, crazy breakaway speed, like right. I said. But even so, I still think that 
Marshawn has a little bit more juice as that at that top speed. And, and that plays more. Right? Yeah, I was about to say that plays in the pass protection and as well. In the pass yeah. protection yeah. as well. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the similar cutback ability as Corm. Like to your point, I'm glad that you brought that up because yeah, their their cutback ability is similar to me. The lateral quickness and stuff like that. You mentioned the production and all that stuff. But if you go look at him, if you go look at Marshawn at uh, SC, the year he was there or the time he was there, he was. Decently productive, and but to average seven point yards a carry this yeah. past season Depressive. is is lets you know this guy yeah. can rumble if he needs to rumble. And can I slide one more dude in? Yeah, one more because I'm geeking over here. Go for it. You guys watch uh, Jerzan Newton from Illinois? I have a yes. hilarious story about. Jerzan. I watched okay. him last year. I think I still <laughs> got my notes in here. I'd love to, <laughs> to hear the story, but as far as defensive tackles go, like man, w- would I like to see the consistency with his get off a little bit more? Yes. But holy moly, this yeah. dude was a fun watch. Yes. I mean, and, and I love his his awareness. He puts that big paw up. He is swatting balls to the line of scrimmage. He takes on double teams. I think he can play three tech. I think he can kick out and play some five tech. He's got some versatility. Hmm. Plays with tremendous leverage. Well, it was one of my notes on him. And I, I love him. I mean, he's a little bit smaller, maybe. The arm length will give him yeah, some Yeah, short arms. Yeah. Short arms. But yeah. to me, I mean, he does do a good job of, of shedding blocks and being able to chase play. Scrape sure. down the line of scrimmage. T- Newton was a fun study. Yes, interesting. You put him next to a ham, he's gonna go nuts. Yeah. He's his. To your point, I watched him. I remember watching him last year because we were so Illinois, impressed by the yeah. Illinois defense right. in general. Yeah, that's right. So well coached, and that secondary back there, baby. You think they was? You think they was thriving just because? Nah, that yeah. that front four was steady for Illinois as well. And so, yeah, I like his hands too. The violence of yes. his hands. I think that's what helps him, even yeah. though he has short no arms. Doubt. Yeah, yeah. Doubt. it's no, hard. No, you're right. The hand fighting is there, so yeah. he's he is an interesting watch. I'm gonna find my notes. There's and the bend was more impressive than I was anticipating when I first started watching. I was like, man, this guy's got some bend to him. You so know what this funny. sounds like? It sounds like Kalijah Cansey from Pitt last year thicker. to a certain extent. Yeah. He's, yeah. Bigger. he's thicker. Yeah. This what guy is six what was two two ninety five? Okay, and Cansey was like two eighty. Yeah, he was yeah. a little bit of a smaller uh, guy, but yeah, this guy's super disruptive. Mm-hmm. I, you guys are right about that. Uh, the chase is excellent, and, it, and when he gets in position. I mean, this guy, I always say it in my notes, like, this guy, he's got like a dynamic initial burst. Yes. The yes. way he comes off the ball and gets into these blockers. Love it. A lot of names flying around. That's what we wanted this first day. Don't worry, fans. We will have Twitter on the 20 tomorrow. It Mercy. will happen. We will have Twitter on the 20. 20, 20, 20. Whenever we were sitting out the rundown, I was like, I want to get names out here. I want to just start hitting as many prospects as possible. Man, you guys are on your game today. When we come back, though, We'll have to be on our game a little bit more because it's time to grade the 2023 class. And does the lack of production change your draft philosophy for the Dallas Cowboys? More draft show right after this. Hi, Drew Pearson, former Dallas Cowboy and now Pro Football Hall of Famer here. If you're struggling with your vision and tired of those contacts and glasses, don't throw a Hail Mary. Go where I went. Laser Care Eye Center, the official LASIK partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Drew, thank you so much for trusting us with your vision correction procedure. At Laser Care Eye Center, we offer six different vision correction procedures to help patients see. Check them out at dfwis.com. Tell them Drew sent you. Hood, hood. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott, who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With Blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. Hi, I'm Danny McCray, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or anytime you want to munch. 
Mm. And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Back here on the Draft Show, presented by Miller Lite, here from the SWBC studios at the Star in Frisco. Aisha Morrison, Zach Wolchuk, Brian Broaddus, Nick Harris, Chris Beam in the back. I'm Kyle Yeomans. All right, this is the uh, the segment that I feel like all of us are probably going to uh, reg- regret talking about at some point, Just, but we have to talk some about it. Some days you struggle. Yeah, just got to talk about it. 2023 draft class for the Dallas Cowboys. Unfortunate breaks in... The area of DeMarvian overshone yep. going down early in the season. But you have first round pick Mozzie Smith, second round pick Luke Schoonmaker, fourth round pick Viliami Fahoko. Then you have Eric Scott Jr. You have uh, Awesome Richards in the fifth round. You have Deuce Vaughn in the sixth round. Uh, and then, yeah, not a whole lot of production across the board. Jalen Brooks was a seventh round yep. pick. <clears throat> not a ton of production. Brian. You've been in these draft rooms. You've been in these war rooms. We've had before. drafts like this before. Here. You've had ups <laughs> and you've had downs. Well, I'm doing radio with you guys right yeah, now. <laughs> yeah. Where does this change things, if at all? Yeah. In terms of your philosophy moving forward. Well, what, what's disappointing to me is though I think you had a clear plan for what you wanted to do with um, with Mozzie. I think that you had an idea, and then all of a sudden it switched yeah. and. You know, the thing with Mozzie, and we all watch the games, the one problem that Mozzie has is when he doesn't get off the snap quick enough. He gets blocked, you know, and then maybe the weight loss was trying to, in his way of saying, oh, I could be quicker. I could get off the ball quicker if I'm smaller. But that's really not what I felt like the vision for Mozzie Smith was, you know. So the, the vision, uh, let's be honest, before the draft, remember we were talking about tight ends in the first round. They were talking about Laporta. Yeah. Yeah. Remember we were all kind of looking mm-hmm. at you like, damn, they might take Laporta here in the first round. Well, they were smart about that. They obviously yeah. had a vision for what Luke Schoonmaker. We all saw Luke Schoonmaker as more of a blocker, a guy that when Blake Corum ran the football, who was it going behind? It was is, behind Schoonmaker. It was behind Schoonmaker in this mm-hmm. offensive line, and those they're getting pushed and all that. So you had a vision for that. Overshone, unfortunate what happened for him. I'm doing a preseason game. He's six plays. He's got three tackles. I'm going, damn, this guy needs to be on the field more. Yeah. You know, it, you just kind of go down through it, and it it there's it's a really good roster, but the young players that the the top players that they had visions for. It didn't work out. I can understand the Eric Scotts and people like that down the Brooks down the you know down the line because you're kind of looking for traits and trying to find it. But when you don't hit on the top three guys, that that makes it look a lot worse than it really is. You yeah. know, and I I, I they had vision for these players and what they could do. It's just they did not they were not. Uh, they did not live up to the vision, I believe, that the front office had for what those guys uh, could could give them. And 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 they're playing from behind. Schoonmaker was injured, what in mini camps and stuff like that. Yeah, I was ask that. Lost some, you know. I'm not making Slow excuses start. for the guy, but he was at Michigan. You watch him, man. He was a physical player, and I thought, well, he's gonna, you know, him Ferguson, they're gonna be fine. You know, one of the reasons why you don't run the ball particularly well is point of attack blocking at the edge you know with your tight ends has not been great you know and that's why you tried to go get schoonmaker and it didn't work out right now I mean, but you know hey we've seen <clears throat> dalton schultz here not do anything you know and then two years later he's you know he's off doing great things yeah. so you know that's my hope for guys like that yeah, but it, it's unfortunate that they got no production out of the really the top three guys that they drafted I mean, I think that that's important. I think it's, you know, take it, take a beat. You know, did, did you get the production that you wanted from these guys year one? No. I think the Dalton Schultz comparison is, is a brilliant one. Yeah. There were questions, is he going to make the roster? Then he yeah. turns into one of your most reliable players. And I think Schoonmaker is a guy, you were watching him on film. I think the blocking started to come along. Yeah. You started to see him do a better job as the season went. Uh, you know, as a receiver, you, you, you've got a guy in Jake Ferguson that's emerging as one of the best tight ends in the NFL. So, I mean, that, that can come along nicely. 
obviously, but you know you wanted him to try and help your running game as an inline blocker. The Mozzie thing with the weight loss fascinates me. I think you saw flashes from Mozzie this year at times, and he's a guy that naturally is not going to just fill up the stat sheet, right? He's not going to be a Micah Parsons for you or a, or a Fowler with the splash plays that yeah. we talked about on post game shows before. But, you know, you want Mozzie to do some of the dirty work, and I think that maybe some of it was frustration on his part as well. Yeah. Uh, I think that he expects a lot out of himself, and he didn't quite get that this year. But, I mean, Jalen Tolbert was a guy that people quit on last year. Tolbert gave you some good moments this year. So just because there wasn't a good rookie season, I- I'm not quitting on some of these guys. I mean, mm-hmm. I still – I liked Junior Fajoko. He was a guy, the motor. There was a lot of stuff that I liked. Crazy him. production. Didn't get to play a lot. I mean, it's awesome. Richard's a guy that did get to play a little bit due to injury yeah. this year, and I don't think was terrible in yeah. the reps that he got as well. Is that a guy that ends up getting – a bigger role. So I think that the jury's still out the final grade on this draft class, how good, how bad it is. I think there's a still wait-and-see approach here. But certainly year one, you didn't hit on your top two, three. Yeah. Well, I think you would have hit on Overshone. I think people would have viewed this differently if Overshone had been healthy. I agree. Yeah. And I think you're also – the frustration's probably amplified a significant margin because you look at the last couple drafts, you've had immediate impact from your previous right. three drafts. Yes. Right. CeeDee Lamb, Trayvon Diggs, Neville Gallimore, Tyler Biotish in 2020. 2021, it was Micah Parsons, Osa Digizua. 2022, it was Tyler Smith, Jake Ferguson, Deron Bland. Yeah. Immediate production from those three draft classes. Right. And then you get into 2023, and you, like you said, the vision was there. Yeah. The, the effort was there in terms of putting those guys on the field and making them fit into a certain role. It just didn't work out. But does that mean the vision changes this time around? Whenever you go into a separate draft process. Yeah, I, but you know what? This this organization does a good job now of taking the best available player on the board. Yeah. And I trust them for that. Because, I mean, I, I to me, I don't think they – I think they have an idea of going in what they would like to get. But they, they, they've done a good job of saying, you know what? This is our stack. We're going to take this guy right now. You know, I mean, we talk about, oh, they need an edge. Oh, they need a linebacker. Oh, and then they take a CD lamb or something like that. And you're like yeah. going, wow, okay. That, I applaud them for what they've done. I think that approach will always work here. I think that's why they're one of the best drafting teams. I think it's unfortunate that the top three guys didn't get any production, real production this year. I don't think that changes for them. Yeah. I think they're going to stack their board. I think they're going to look at the – they're going to grade the players. They're not going to window dress their board. And they're going to stack them up there. And if when it's their turn to pick, they're going to take their top guy. I trust them to do that. I really, really do. Since it is the first draft show, and then we may have some new listeners along the way, window dressing a board, what does yeah. that mean terminology? Yeah, you, you, don't, you don't want to just put guys in spots just because, if you know, if you really don't believe a guy's a first-round player, don't just put him up in the first round in, up there because everybody else in the league thinks he's a first-round yep. player. If you really believe that, or or if if somebody's got a guy in the third round, uh, for example, uh, Travis Frederick, everybody has Travis Travis Frederick as a as a third round player. They took him at pick thirty. You know, yeah, that's still below probably our cut line. We probably had twenty three first round grades, so he was more like a second round player. But they they took him at thirty. See, that's that's if you believe that a guy is that player, put him where you would take him. You know, don't window dress your board. Don't just put them up there because you. Uh, every, all the scouting services said that's what you have to do. And this is not a team that window dresses their board. They will not window dress their Tr- board. Tyler Smith, they no. took him above yeah. The, yeah. the pay grade yep. at the time. Absolutely. I mean, Mozzie Smith, Mozzie, yeah, well, yeah. Some of them have worked. Some of them, at least at this point, yeah. have not. Absolutely. I'm with Zach. I'm not giving up on Mozzie Smith and Luke Schoomaker just yet. I think DeMarvey and Overshone can be a, a, a guy. But this is not an organization that in the past has window dressed their board. And no. I think you should take comfort in that yeah. Yeah. moving forward. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about this this draft, this past draft class, and like you guys talked about, the lack of production, I know we, we are giving them some time and stuff because development is important, but it did hurt. It to, did. To oh, me. It did. It did. Mm-hmm. Especially, I mean, you mentioned Junior Fajoko. I was really sad, low key, that we didn't get to see him this season because one thing that stood out stood out about him on tape was how he can contain the edge and and defend the edge. And I, baby, look, where did people attack you this year? Yeah, yeah. along the edge. Yeah, have mercy, yeah. Um, because I feel like his uh, I felt like his size 
didn't take away from his speed. And to your point, the explosiveness, his ability to shed and tackle, his power yeah. is was a, was a problem for tackles. And so I was looking at him because if you're smart, you're not just going to run at Demarcus Lawrence. The Cowboys have been needing an yeah. edge opposite of Demarcus Lawrence that can consistently stop the run. Yep. You got guys that can rush the passer. You haven't had a guy that can go over there and man that spot and make people have to make decisions. And so I was really looking forward to him. So to see, you know, that this year to see him not have that opportunity to be on the field where he just didn't get on the field was that stood out to me. But also with Schoonmaker, Doug, 12 personnel could have helped you a lot this year. And it wasn't that they didn't run it. It's the fact that there's an element of football that matters and people know Big homie ain't catching no passes for real. Yeah. <laughs> so it don't matter if you're running them out there and you're doing some 12 personnel type stuff. People are – they're focusing on Ferguson. And yeah. having another receiving tight end yeah. could have made a hell of a difference in the way this offense was run. And, yeah. and don't get me wrong, I, I did like some of the things that Schoolmaker mm. did in the blocking game and mm-hmm. stuff. But the lack of the lack of receiving from that second tight end, it hurt this year, sure and did. I do think it could have opened up this offense a little more if you got some production there. No doubt. Yeah, they started treating Ferguson like a wide receiver. But you're seeing like you're seeing you qu- <laughs> quarters playing on him, you know, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think the, I'm with you guys on the jury still being out for this class, but I, I think you also have to look at the results and what's on paper, and it's the fact that you had eight draft picks, and only two of them were active for every game this yeah. season, and wow. only two of them were really uh, a real, uh, key players that were on the field quite a bit. Um, you know, I look at Schoonmaker as being probably the best draft pick and you know based on his production that's probably not the best thing in the world yeah. I think well I think TJ Bass is the best rookie in this in, in yes. entire class yeah though. Um, what TJ Bass was able to do and bring to the field you also got to look at Hunter Lipke and what he was able to do I know that fumble in Miami was got tough better. but yeah. uh, TJ Bass I, I think he was uh, kind of the saving grace of the the rookie class and you were right yeah. about him yeah you were right yeah. you guys yeah. were TJ, talking TJ about him Bass, he should have been drafted yeah. I mean there's a lot of people that you know like damn we missed on that guy um put some Put some respect on Jalen Brooks a little bit. I, I, I he didn't get yeah. to he no. didn't get to do a, a whole whole bunch, but I feel like the times we did see him, he was productive. But he showed you more than what I think people expected of him, especially like see, coming in. I'm yeah. thinking, I mean, yeah. we thought like, Special oh, this guy's team. gonna be he's a gunner. Undrafted, yeah. camp body, yeah. Yeah. and I mean, then he comes traits. in and he's sure hands, yeah. strong yeah. hands, yeah. really weird, sneaky quickness, which makes no sense. He uses his length really well. Those yep. long strides. I personally do think he does have some upside yeah. as a receiver, and we could mm-hmm. see maybe what he's capable of. You have something? Yeah, I'll tell you, he's probably the only draft pick that overperformed. I was just about to say that. Yeah, if is. you were looking at mm-hmm. top to bottom, one through through eight of the draft picks last year, he's the only one that went. Overshone above. asterisk, but yeah. Overshone yes, could have. got to be yeah. fair to him. Asterisk. But asterisk. he's the only one that, that went above the expectations. Yeah. Everybody else was probably below expectations as what, a rookie. Have y'all heard anything about Eric Scott? Have has there been any and like and don't get me wrong I caught up with him early on because when you looked at him on tape you said okay this guy can press he's yeah. sticky got that little you know that mm-hmm. velcro Ball little type he plays the also loved him absolutely Quinn loved him yes right and so obviously we didn't get a chance to see him he did have a little bit of a point in. Um, uh, preseason, pre-season where he was struggling I caught up with him I asked him they were working if I'm not mistaken they were working uh, zone concepts with him because you, you got to be able to do both in, yeah. in this place you know so did y'all hear anything throughout the season or any updates on him not, tots. not specifically I think <laughs> Everybody's face. I think what no. you what you were outlining is is about the the rundown on Eric Scott. Okay, track him. They're trying to get him more comfortable with zone concepts. He played a lot of man at Southern Miss. He was mostly press corner. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was up top and, and physical. Mm-hmm. They want him to be able to to track at the same time yeah. and cover. And I, I just think he wasn't ready for that as a rookie. But if you're a six round pick, you're expected to have a, a little right. bit of leeway. Get into a developmental of side of things. Come back from camp this year. He's going to have to have a big camp. If well, he they really gave wants up a pick it, for him for the strap, and that's, that's why I'm asking yeah, because yeah. they clearly they saw something in him. in him. They did. They gave uh, up a pick this draft to move up and get him. Well, Actually, Tater Tots, yeah. we talk about. We'll get some Eric Scott this year. Yeah. Well. well is the DC going to be the same? Because if the DC not the same, <laughs> yeah. he might not like. He might not like him. The get down not, with the I get down. I'll tell you we'll what. talk about this tomorrow, too. I, I know this, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I know we're going over here, but really quick, I I'm think sorry. there is an opportunity for Eric Scott to be able to jump in if they decide to move on from Jordan Lewis. I think mm-hmm. there's yeah. an opportunity for him in nickel. Yep. Okay. Good to think about. That's, yeah. Okay. And there's there's opportunities that could line up for a lot of these rookies. Mm-hmm. The 2023 rookies, specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Spots at edge rusher for Viliami Fajoko. Spots on the offensive line for Austin Richards. 
Is it foregone conclusion that that's where they're going to end up plugging in? Absolutely not. There's a lot that can happen between now and then, including from a coaching staff standpoint, like Aisha just eloquently put a couple moments ago. Uh, Who's your DC? Who's your head coach? Who is going to be on the opposite side of the building? We will continue to monitor that as we go on. Tomorrow, we're going to dive deeper into this 2024 draft class. I want to do some more telling me more. We'll have some Twitter on the 20, and we'll continue to get you ready for 99 days away. The NFL draft in Detroit, Michigan, coming up here in just a couple of months. That does it for us here on the initial episode here in 2024. For Chris Beam, Zach Wolchuk, Nick Harris, Brian Broaddus, Aisha Morrison, I'm Kyle Yeoman saying so long from the Star in Frisco. We'll see you tomorrow. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about you, Cowboys?